Thank you for your kind invitation to come back and speak to this uh, great school and students, faculty. In the early 1800s, a Presbyterian pastor by the name of Robert Murray McShane had a brief but yet very effective and fruitful ministry. He served in a difficult region and yet 700 people would come to know Christ personally. He used to tell people uh, and other pastors especially that they should preach to their people as if they were on the brink of eternity. And he died after a fruitful ministry, though brief, at the age of 29 from typhus. His uh, ministry was so profoundly affected, uh, so profoundly affected Scotland that for, for years to come, uh, people would refer to Robert Murray McShane. In fact, uh, British expositor John Phillips, now with the Lord, uh, in one of his uh, commentaries, told the story that after, a few years after McShane had died, uh, another pastor was so deeply concerned that his own ministry was not bearing fruit for Christ that he decided to visit the church where McShane had pastored and, and just walk around the grounds and maybe meet some folks that he had pastored. And, and he went there and, and sure enough, there was a custodian hard at work on, uh, in the building and he asked the custodian uh, if he knew uh, Mr. McShane and he said yes. In fact, I was the custodian when uh, Mr. McShane was pastoring here and uh, he asked him, would you give me a little tour of uh, the church? And he, he shook his head, head gladly, willingly. So he, he took the pastor on a little tour and uh, while they were walking along, he said, would you by any chance know, since you knew him, some secret to his effective, fruitful ministry? And this elderly custodian nodded his head again and he said, come with me. And he took this pastor to McShane's former study. For the most part, in honor of him, much of it hadn't changed. And he told this pastor, sit there in his chair. And he did. He said, now put your elbows up on his desk. And he did. He said, now uh, put your face in your hands. And he did. And he said, now weep. Weep for your flock. Weep for your community and your world. The psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 126 and verse 5, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. The one who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed. Get that picture in your mind. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall come again with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves, his fruit, his harvest with him. Now the immediate context of that psalm is, is the return of Israel from exile. Their tears are being replaced with shouts of joy. They're once again uh, uh, planning to harvest in their land. I find it intriguing though that the concept of sowing and weeping is picked up in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus will talk about sowing the seed of the word, Matthew 13. Paul uses the same analogy with sowing and the work of God and bringing fruit and making it grow, 1 Corinthians 3. In fact, earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he tells the Corinthians that the letters I wrote to you, they have been bathed in my tears. Paul tells the Ephesian elders as he's preparing to leave them that he taught them and he ministered to them with tears and through trials, Acts chapter 20, verse 19. A little later on, he says, I admonished you for three years with tears. And you'd think, wait a second, I want the fruitful ministry of Paul, but I don't want to cry about people or over people for three years. That would be a sign that God wants me in another ministry. But for three years, I bathed my ministry among you with tears. Now, in Paul's day, the gods 
of the Pantheon were unmovable. They, they were unmoved in, in uh, their attributes. They cared nothing for the human condition. They cared nothing for human grief or human sorrow. They were called, uh, in Paul's day, this unmovable quality was referred to as apatheia, which we've transliterated to give us our word apathy. The gods were simply apathetic. They were unmoved. So the recommendation in the psalm to bear seed and minister the word, and what we see in the apostolic community of this bathing of ministry with tears. I mean, to serve Christ with that kind of emotion and passion doesn't seem to be godlike. Certainly wouldn't have been in the first century. But has it ever occurred to you that we never read in the New Testament where Jesus laughed? Now, I believe he did. In fact, I would have been in stitches some of the times he would, he would pin those Pharisees to the wall. I, I know his, his disciples doubled over many times, and I believe Jesus, being fully human, laughed. But we're never explicitly told that. What would shock the early believer is that the Son of God would weep openly, that he wasn't like the other gods who were apathetic. John's Gospel, which is familiar to you at chapter 11, you remember when he arrives at the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus has been dead for four days, and he is intentionally waited before arriving. And when he arrives and stands near the tomb, we're told in verse 33 that he was deeply moved in his spirit and agitated or troubled. So he's obviously not apathetic to the human condition of grief and sorrow and loss. In fact, the verb translated, he became troubled, was used in Paul's day of a horse straining under the harness, breathing heavily. Phillips translates it, he was deeply moved and visibly distressed. And then, of course, you arrive at verse 35, where you read the shocking statement, Jesus wept. God cried. In fact, the tense of that construction would render this, Jesus burst into tears. Even knowing what he knew, he joins the universal emotion of suffering and, and loss over death and the grief of the grave and sorrow. The rabbis, of course, taught that in Jesus' day that the soul of the deceased hovered over the body for three days, hoping to re-enter it. And once they saw the decay at the fourth day, they would go on to Sheol, believing now that they could no longer resuscitate the body. So it isn't a coincidence that Jesus intentionally waits four days. Lazarus will not be resuscitated from nearly dying. He will be resurrected from the dead. And Jesus will then utter that wonderful shout, Lazarus, come forth. Literally, Lazarus, here, outside. Lazarus, here, outside. Augustine was the first church leader to make the observation that had Jesus not called Lazarus by name, everyone in the cemetery would have immediately come forth. But Jesus confines it to this one man for now. So resurrection fruit, life, followed tears of sorrow. Like the writer of Hebrews tells us that in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications, get this, with loud crying and tears. Frankly, we have no idea how the burden that Christ carried over his mission and over the world made him weep and it makes me want to ask myself and you what do you weep for what have you cried over what is it that you want so badly from ministry involvement that it brings you to tears I want to do something a little different and spend the rest of our session simply illustrating this text from a biography. I often tell my staff and uh, 
students that you'd better learn to take a vacation between the covers of a book because that may be all you get. Need, you need to learn to go into the life and the, and, and the ministry of someone to learn lessons that they learn by way of observation. So climb between the covers of a biography. And I usually have two or three going. This one particularly uh, profoundly impacted me. And so I want you to know about this couple as they illustrate this psalm and the ministry of our Lord and the ministry of the apostles. You've probably never heard of them before. I hope you never forget them. It all begins in 1921. Uh, David Flood and his young wife Savea and their little two-year-old son leave Sweden for the interior of Africa. They traveled with another couple, the Ericsons. They served together in their local church. In fact, Savea was the violinist and the soloist. Uh, they had committed, however, their lives to the gospel in, in the interior of these unreached tribes. And now they're filled with enthusiasm and and excitement and optimism as they literally hack their way through the jungles of the Congo. And they don't have a, a village planned. They're just going to arrive and begin ministry. To their surprise, when they arrive at the first village, they're not allowed entrance. The chief won't let them in. They're fearful that these uh, individuals will, will upset the, the tribal gods and they won't let them in. And so after weeks, again, of, of, of treacherous journeying, they come to another village and they're turned away again. And on to another village and they're turned away again. And again. And again. Months of carrying their own supplies, hunger, weakness, they prayed as they reached yet one more village that God would open that door and allow them entrance and some rest. But the chief in this village was more hostile than any other chief they'd encountered, and he demanded that they leave. Their biography reads, they struggled to carry their supplies to the summit of a little hill nearby, and putting up their tents, they knew they were too weary and weak to set out again. So they decided to clear away the brush from the top of that hill and build mud huts and do their best to reach this hostile people. During the, the next agonizing weeks and, and months, David and Savea flood struggled to learn Swahili along with the Ericsons. They did everything they could possibly think of doing and the chief would, would not relent and they would, they would not be allowed in. Both couples often wept as they prayed out and, and, and with, with loud crying for God to open a door for the gospel, but no door opened. In fact, villagers were prohibited from going up the hill to visit them. Only one little boy was allowed to sell them chickens and eggs once a week. David was in particular, somewhat amazed and, and skeptical of his wife's insistence that while they may never reach that village, and, and it doesn't look like they're going to reach much of the Congo, that perhaps they could win this child for Christ. And so every time this little boy visited their camp, she showered uh, love and attention, sowing the seeds of the gospel into his little heart. And, and the other missionaries watched one afternoon, months later, as Savea and that little boy knelt together on top of that hill and with tears coming down her cheeks, she heard this little boy pray in repentance and faith believing in Christ. But he had to keep his decision for Christ a secret, lest he wouldn't be allowed to return or worse. But to the others, to the Ericsons, this mission was a complete failure. And so they eventually decided to leave David and Savea flood and their little boy and return to an established mission many miles away. And even, even though the floods continued to battle malaria and, and desperately uh, crude conditions, they decided to stay. 
Sometime later, Savea announced that she was expecting their second child. Now, she's already weak. She's already struggling physically, and David is fearing the worst. It was really too late, and she's too weak to travel through the jungles of the Belgian Congo, you know, without risking her life and the life of their unborn child. And so the baby is going to be born in this mud hut on the mountain. The young native boy who'd become a Christian carried the news back to the village and to their surprise and, and, and joy, the chief allowed a midwife to come and spend time there and help her when the delivery uh, time arrived. By the time the baby was due, Savea was already weak with malaria. She is in pain, suffering from high fever, and their little girl is born, and Savea whispers that she should be called Aina, a classic Swedish name. Seventeen days later, Savea Flood died. Hopeless, filled with a, a sense of rage, bitterness, David digs a crude grave and buries his 27-year-old wife. And how, he thinks, can he possibly take care of a two-year-old son and now a sickly little baby girl without assistance? And with that, he hires a villager and with several others, and he takes his two children down the mountain and miles away to that mission station. He is finished with the ministry. He is finished with the gospel. He is finished with God. As far as he is concerned, God has taken the life of his bride and his ministry has refused to answer his prayer. This has been nothing less than a tragic waste. The problem, again, though, is how does he get back home? How does he go to get to Sweden? This is a monumental task. He has a difficult, it's difficult enough caring for a two-year-old boy, much less how is he going to feed and care for this baby girl? Well, the Ericsons at that mission station have been unable to have children, and, and David offers them the opportunity to adopt Aina, and they gladly welcome the opportunity, and they... They adopt her. With that, David leaves with his son, never to return again. He never even looks back. Before Aina turns one year old, Joel and Bertha Erickson have their food poisoned by unbelieving natives and within days of each other die an agonizing death. Aina is once again without parents. She's soon claimed by another missionary couple who choose to raise her as their own daughter. When she's three years old, that adoptive missionary couple leaves the mission field of the Congo and eventually settles in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Her Swedish name will be changed to Aggie, but in this as I've edited down her biography for you, I'm just going to refer to her as she does as Aina. She would later write that even as a young girl, she knew she was different. She became known as the daughter of the missionary who died on the mountain, rescued by missionaries who were poisoned, and as the title of her biography reads, should you care to get it for yourself, a girl without a country. Eventually, Aina comes to faith, attends North Central Bible College in Minneapolis and meets and marries a godly young man who is entering the ministry and with that then the decades just fly by. She has no information about her father. She knows very little of her past. She knows her parents' names, David and Savea Flood. She doesn't know the language of her homeland and really beyond that knows nothing else. She really doesn't have time to think about it. She has a husband, a family, a busy ministry. In fact, her husband, Dewey Hurst, uh, 
has become the president of a Bible college in Seattle, Washington, where they, they move and they continue in ministry into their 40s and early 50s. Then one day, unexpectedly, and she will never know how, a Swedish religious magazine shows up in her mailbox. She has no idea who sent it, and she can't read it. She doesn't know the language. But she turns the pages over, and there's a photograph that arrests her attention. It's a, it's a picture of a, a, of a grave, a crude grave, and a small white cross planted in the earth, and on the cross is the name Sevea Flood. She jumps in the car and she races to the college. There's a Swedish uh, professor who knows the language and she gives her the magazine and stands there breathlessly as this professor, as she begins to translate the article and it talks about two missionaries as they're pushing through the African jungle, they're camping at night, they're traveling by day, they come across a village in the Belgian Congo and, and across this burial plot and they take this picture then they begin to inquire and they find out that it's a missionary mother who dies soon after delivering a baby and, and, but not before leading one little boy to Christ. And, and, uh, and then the father leaves and leaves the, the baby girl in the hands of other missionaries and, and you know the rest of that story. Well, at any rate, the article continues that Savea Flood didn't live long enough to learn that that little boy, she'd won to Christ uh, was allowed to start a school and he became the teacher and he shared the gospel with his students and they all came to believe in Christ and they evangelized their parents and they came to Christ and now that village had 600 believers and a vibrant church all because of the sacrifice and the tears and the sowing of David and Savea Flood. Aina can't believe the news she thanks God for letting her learn the truth of her parents and a little bit of her history and the harvest. And, and then that's sort of the end of the story. Well, for their 25th wedding anniversary, the Bible College gave the hearse a vacation in Sweden where, among other things, Aina could trace her history and perhaps find her father. It wasn't difficult to find him David Flood had remarried, now had four children, but his wife had died sometime earlier. He, now an old man, was wasting away as an alcoholic and a professed agnostic who dared anyone to mention the name God to him. After a rather emotional reunion with her half-brothers and, and sister, Aina brings up the subject of seeing her father and they're rather pessimistic and they try to discourage her from doing that, telling her, you know, he's deeply bitter. He, he won't have anything to do with them, by the way, and he, and he hates God. They tell her, if you do see him, just know whenever he hears the name of God, he flies into a rage and then gets drunk again. She was determined to see him she eventually made it to his little apartment. The door is answered by a, a part-time housekeeper who isn't all that effective. In the room, there are liquor bottles. She writes on every windowsill. The table is covered with more bottles. And in the far corner, she writes, is a small, wrinkled old man lying on a rumpled bed, his head turned toward the wall. Diabetes and a stroke had further crippled him to that room for the last three years. She writes, I walked over to his bed and I took his hand and I said, Papa. He turned and looked at me and immediately began to weep saying, Aina, I never wanted to give you away. It's all right, Papa. God took care of me. And with that, he stiffened and his tears stopped and he spat out God. <laughs> 
God forgot us all. I was in Africa all that time, all our efforts, all our suffering, all our tears, and only one little boy, and then I lost your mother. Don't talk to me of God. She writes, Papa, I've got a story to tell you. You didn't go to Africa in vain. Mother didn't die in vain. The little boy you won to the Lord grew up to win that whole village to Jesus, and now 40 years later, there are 600 people in that village serving Christ because you followed the call of God in your life, and you planted that seed. God wanted you to know even today it was not in vain. David Flood turned slowly around until his eyes met mine, hopeful eyes, longing to believe, longing for the turmoil of his tortured life to be redeemed in some way. And Diana said, Papa, it's a well-known story now. We have a great God. The tears returned and he began to talk and by the end of that afternoon, she writes, the kindness of God brought him back, the prodigal to repentance and restoration of fellowship with God. Aina and her husband eventually returned to America, and a few weeks later, David Flood went home. Aina would learn that in the final moments of his life, in his delirium, he had begun speaking in Swahili. You'd think that's the end of the story. Let me give you one addendum. It'll be a few years later when Aina and her husband would attend an evangelism conference in London, England, and several leaders representing uh, denominations and associations throughout Africa where they're giving their reports. And one report was given by the superintendent of a national church association, and he spoke eloquently about the spread of the gospel throughout his country, now Zaire, the Republic of Congo. And he said, we have 32 mission stations, a 120-bed hospital, several large Christian schools, and our churches now have 110,000 baptized believers. Afterwards, Aina rushed up to him to ask him questions, of course, you know, and one in particular, I'll, I'll let her again speak. Sir, could you have met a young missionary couple by the name of David and Savea Flood? They're on a mission station. All I know about is that, you know, that station was high on a hill. Oh, yes, he said. I used to sell them chickens and eggs once a week. It was Savea Flood who led me to Christ, and, and he said, and who are you? And she said, I'm Savea Flood's daughter. I was born on that mountain. He immediately embraced me and swayed as he held me, sobbing, and he said, I have so often wondered whatever happened to that little girl whose mother died for us. And then he said, you must travel back to the Congo. Your mother is the most famous person in our church history. <laughs> and she agreed. It took months of planning, but Aina and her husband made the long journey to the place of her birth. They eventually arrived at the outpost where she had been given to the Ericsons, the missionary couple. This was the outpost where she had lived as a toddler by the age of three, already speaking Swahili, learning that language and making friends. She visited the graves of her adopted parents who were poisoned to death, and eventually they drove the miles back into the bush to the village. Her parents had cried out to God to reach. Only this time, 
She writes, there were hundreds of villagers waiting, lining that dirt road as they came into view, cheering and smiling and laughing. They had built arches covered with flowers for her reception. (laughs) A little taste of the bima, by the way. Naina writes, after many hugs and greetings, eventually the pastor of the village church led me up the hill, followed by These believers, and there at the top of the hill was this flat place with a grove of trees, and the pastor pointed to it and said, that is where your parents' hut stood, and that is where you were born. He then turned and pointed without a word to a simple grave framed in cement, and over it stood a tall, beautiful palm tree that looked out over the valley. And there was a cross marking the grave, written on it, Sevea Flood, 1896-1923. Aina writes, I was standing where my mother had stood. I was standing where my mother knelt. And I now knew the harvest of the seed that she had sown in the heart of one little boy. By the way, how big do you want your ministry to be? How many people do you want to reach? Don't ever overlook one little boy. And the pastor opened his Bible, surrounded by hundreds of villagers, And he lifted his voice and he read one line from the book of Psalms. Psalm 126. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And so, Father, would you lead us to cry for eternal things. Would you teach us to weep for a spiritual harvest, for fruit, perhaps just one, but fruit that will, with us, praise you forever and ever.